Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is physics and consciousness. With me is Saul Paul Sirag, who is the author of ADEX Theory, How the ADE Coxeter Graphs Unify Mathematics and Physics. Now, Saul Paul is an old friend of mine. I've actually done a, an in-presence segment in presence number 68 about him, and I'm linking to it right now in case you would like to check it out because it goes into some depth about his background. I'm very happy to be able to present him here on New Thinking Aloud. However, this interview is going to be something of an experiment for me because Saul Paul does not travel, and he lives in Eugene, Oregon. So, uh, because I couldn't uh, bring him here to Albuquerque, I've made special arrangements to interview him on Skype. And possibly, this, if this works out well, it'll open the door for other more long-distance interviews on the new Thinking Aloud channel. Welcome, Saul Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, yeah, it's great to see, to see this working again. <laughs> yeah. It, I know it's taken a little bit to get the Skype connection where we want it for a good quality uh, video. Let me ask you this question now. Uh, some time ago, you were quoted as saying that the laws of physics are actually the laws of the mind because we don't know anything at all about the physical universe uh, except what we know uh, that's mediated through human consciousness. Yes, well, that's that's the basic idea intrinsic to what's called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is still considered the standard interpretation, uh, and especially that's the point of view very clearly stated in John von Neumann's famous book on the foundations of quantum mechanics, published in German in 1933 and in English in the 50s, and he shows that the so-called collapse of the wave function ultimately must occur uh, in consciousness. That's that's the only only fundamental place where it can uh, collapse. Here's why: it's because it's because actually there's uh, intrinsic to to quantum mechanics, there's there's a whole chain, sometimes called the von Neumann chain, because when you do an experiment with with a, a piece of equipment, let's say making some quantum measurement, the thing is that according to quantum mechanics, the measurement of equipment itself is quantum mechanical. It's it's made up, after all, ultimately of things like quarks and other fundamental particles. So the whole thing, so the, so the measurement system, the measurement device itself is quantum mechanical and there would be a Schrodinger wave function for that. that and and uh, we can have a whole chain of these things and ultimately we worry about, well, is it, uh, is it the, the eyes? that are looking at the equipment uh, where the wave function collapses. No, it might be further back in the brain. Uh, and ultimately, it's consciousness itself that, because, after all, um, the, the reading is comes into our consciousness. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's con according to von Neumann, uh, and uh, a follow-up in greater detail, in a way, by by uh, Wigner, Eugene Wigner, both of them, both of them at Princeton, 
um, and they were buddies of each other. They'd gone to the same high school in uh, Hungary. Uh, they knew each other quite well. Um, and especially in Wigner's paper on uh, Notes on the Mind-Body Problem, he really emphasizes this this idea that consciousness is fundamental to reality. Well, you're uh, referring specifically here to the collapse of the wave function, but yeah. e even when it comes to classical physics, uh, without a wave function to collapse, we don't know anything about uh, the world of classical physics except what comes through human consciousness. Yes, that's true, and and classic. Classical physics is really uh, is really a sub uh, a sub theory within quantum mechanics because it, because uh, quantum mechanics deals with um, physics at a more fundamental level than classical physics does. But yes, you're right that e even even if we think in terms of classical physics, uh, that might that's the case. Now, uh, long before classical physics was even well established and worked out, there were philosophers. Um, before like Isaac Paul. Newton, you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm thinking specifically of Berkeley, who, mm -hmm. who, who critiqued Isaac Newton. Oh, okay. Uh, but he famously said, uh, to be is to be perceived. Okay, mm -hmm. meaning to be, and and of course quantum quantum mechanics didn't exist. This is this is in the 18th century, the 17th century, yeah. actually. Uh -huh. uh, and um, so, uh, and and in fact, uh, once Bell's theorem, we'll go into Bell's theorem later, I suppose. But once Bell's theorem came out, and and Clauser's uh, experiments backed up uh, the predictions of quantum mechanics and showed that that uh, the world was, you know, as strange as quantum mechanics claimed it to be, then people, some, some people remembered uh, this famous slogan, in a way, of, of Berkeley called S.A.S. Percipi, which means to be is to be perceived in Latin, of mm. course. Now, we, I just mentioned parenthetically, we're talking about Bishop George Berkeley, for whom the city of Berkeley, California, was named. That's correct. That's absolutely correct, um, because he wrote a long poem, um, which has the lines, Westward, the, the course of empire leads its way. Uh, and, and it was a poem about the attempt to set up... Um, Basically, a university in the Western Hemisphere, which, mm -hmm. he, which he attempted and failed at. But so he wrote this poem as consolation. <laughs> I, I see. Well, we remember that's him. Berkeley, that's why Berkeley was named Berkeley for well, that poem. I, I, another thing about Bishop Berkeley is uh, he he was, as I understand it, a, a British empiricist, and yet at the same time he he maintained that all knowledge is ultimately contained in the mind of God. Yes, well, that was because he was he was in in a way the most radical of the empiricists. He pushed mm -hmm. it all the way, in other words, as far as it could go. And then he came up with this slogan, uh, "Sas Percipi." So then one has to answer, well, what about when we're not looking? Mm -hmm. um, and his answer to that was, "Is well, God is always looking." Yeah, and so therefore. God guarantees the reality of the world even when we're not looking. Uh, so, so now I would say that 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 idea is is more uh, taken up by the idea of of uh, universal consciousness mm -hmm. um, rather than necessarily a Bishop Barclay type God figure. Um, well, it seems to me if we're going to get into uh, the essence of uh, physics and consciousness, a good place to go from here would be to look at why it is that Einstein was critical of quantum theory. Well, in a way, the, 
uh, you know, quantum theory to a lot of people, uh, other than Einstein, seemed strange. But like Niels Bohr famously said, that uh, if if one uh, hasn't heard the deep is exposed to the details of quantum theory and it doesn't make his head spin, he hasn't heard anything. Hasn't understood and, it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and Einstein definitely understood. He was a very smart guy. And he argued with Bohr uh, for years and years and years, the famous Bohr-Einstein debates about quantum mechanics. Now, Einstein, what Einstein didn't like were actually two different things. Uh, he didn't like the, the indeterminism of quantum mechanics because of the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And he famously said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Of course, his idea of God was uh, just basically a, a kind of metaphor. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, but the other thing that's in a way more interesting is that um, he, he also pointed out uh, that there's a kind of spooky action at a distance implicit in certain quantum mechanical situations. And mm -hmm. he wrote about this with on more than one occasion, but the most important uh, occasion was the paper in 1935 with... Uh, Podolsky and Rosen, so it's called the EPR paper for Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Mm -hmm. And in uh, the spooky, the spooky uh, action at a distance quote is actually in a very interesting set of uh, letters between Einstein and Max Born. They were very good friends and. They wrote letters back and forth about the quantum, about the foundations of quantum mechanics. That's what this, these letters are all about. And um, Max Born was very strong upholder of the the standard uh, Copenhagen interpretation, and Einstein was opposed to that. But they were good friends, and so they they wrote these letters in a careful, gentlemanly way because um, they liked each other. And these. By the way, these letters were published uh, in 72, I think, not 71, actually, when they, when a translation of them into English became available, because they were writing these letters in German, of course. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the spooky action at a distance and the, the, the famous quote about God doesn't play dice with the universe is in, is, is in different Einstein letters to Max Born. Hmm. In, in other words, from Einstein's point of view, if if spooky action at a distance were to occur, then uh, that should be impossible. And so therefore, uh, yes. be, because quantum physics predicts spooky action at a distance, Einstein felt entitled to reject it. Yes. And another, another interesting thing is that in his autobiography, his very short autobiography, um, he he uh, he he didn't use the word spooky at a acting at a distance, but he used another very interesting term. He said it's as if the particles are in telepathic contact with each other. Mm. It's telepathisch, as the uh -huh. German he um, and. Uh, and then later on, uh, he well, actually, actually, in the same book, when one finds uh, in response to Max Born and other people, uh, he says that uh, he had recently run into a, another physicist who said that he was inclined to believe in telepathy, and Einstein said well you must be thinking more about physics than psychology and the, and the other physicists who i think by the way was most likely um was although you know i have no clear evidence of this but because of other things known about him it it is probably wolfgang pauli mm. was a very close friend uh and patient of uh of of Jung, so mm -hmm. he would have been he would have been open to this sort of thing, very open to it. As a matter of fact, um, 
but uh, another as interesting aspect of it of Einstein's attitude about telepathy is that he wrote an introduction to um, to a book called Mental Radio by Upton Sinclair in in which he uh, he, he praises the experiments that Upton Sinclair and his wife were doing, which were, which today would be called distant viewing experiments. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, in effect, Einstein was willing to believe that there could be telepathy between human beings, but not between electrons. <laughs> so, okay. You know, if one, if, if one puts all this together, that's the conclusion you come to. Uh, telepathy between people is okay. Maybe even people and dogs, or who knows. But uh, but between electrons, no. I won't go there. Is what he says. <laughs> but but now I think it's fair to say, due to uh, the developments, uh, subsequent developments, Bell's theorem, Clauser's experiments that we'll talk about, uh, we know now that Einstein was uh, correct about telepathy between humans, but wrong in suggesting that spooky action at a distance or telepathy between electrons cannot occur. That's right. That's right. And um, what we, we, we have a, a really good name now for, um, for this spooky action at a distance. It's called entanglement, which mm -hmm. is, it's very interesting because, because this, this concept of entanglement actually goes back to Schrodinger's paper in 1935, which was actually um, a response to the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paper of 1935. So he's mm -hmm. so he's kind of rubbing it in uh, to Einstein, you know, saying, well, you know, um, there's th what's going on is something I call entanglement, and he he. He went on for several pages about this, mm -hmm. uh, and and he he claimed that entanglement is the most characteristic aspect of quantum mechanics. Now, ordinarily, a physicist would say that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is the most characteristic aspect of quantum mechanics, but uh, Schrodinger Schrodinger felt that entanglement was even more basic. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, and. Another interesting thing about that paper is that it, it of course, was uh, was published in 1935 in German, and in fact, it's a very long paper. It, it was published in three parts, a very long, detailed uh, argument about the EPR situation, the, the thought Einstein's thought experiment, and uh, it was not translated into English until... 1980. Now, we, we should go into some detail on the nature of the EPR thought experiment. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, otherwise what we're saying won't make much sense, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, the EPR thought experiment has to do with particles that are separating from each other spatially, and... Uh, in Einstein's version of the of of this thought experiment, uh, you measure the position of one particle, and you know immediately the momentum of the other particle who is far away, and uh, and he thought of this as a way of of uh, showing that the uncertainty principle that says that that uh, position times momentum has to be greater than or equal to Planck's constant, which is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for those two dynamic variables. So his argument was a way of trying to show that the uncertainty principle isn't fundamental. And so the idea would be that fundamentally underlying this uncertainty of quantum mechanics, there's... Th there's a realistic layer that sometimes called a hidden variable uh, underpinning of, of quantum mechanics. Einstein hoped that there would be hidden variables because that would make quantum mechanics hopefully deterministic. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, and and not only that, but um, but it's important. It's important to, to note that that Bell's theorem, which came out in the 60s, 60, it began in 64, and the experiments based on Bell's theorem showed that that there's a contradiction between between uh, the idea of of um, of the hidden variables and uh, the predictions of quantum mechanics. Mm. So, so what Bell did is he provided a way. He he created what's called the Bell inequality, so that you could do an experiment and test which is right, whether the hidden variable theory is viable, or whether quantum mechanics, as as already worked out in great detail and understood, uh, is correct. And the experiments clearly show, and there have been many, many experiments, starting with John Clauser, published in 1972, and in many other experiments after that, that are much more elaborate and uh, in testing the idea. Mm -hmm. they, they all agree that quantum mechanics is correct, and the hidden, the, the hidden variable theory that Einstein uh, wanted um, just is it not viable mm -hmm. so so we're stuck with uh, the, the strangeness of quantum quantum mechanics um, but uh, an interesting thing is this this notion of of Schrodinger's of entanglement uh, now is all the rage in um, in among physicists and applying it to such things as quantum com quantum computers which Many different laboratories are attempting to uh, to build because a quantum computer would be able to to calculate uh, things that were you couldn't possibly calculate with an ordinary computer. Hmm. We're far from at this point. We're, I think we're far from having um, a real quantum computer, but. Uh, you know, given enough time, we'll have quantum computers probably. And there's also other aspects of this entanglement, which is important, which is um, quantum cryptography, which is which is actively being used by banks um, in uh, in sending banking information over telephone lines and in other ways uh, over over distance, um, so that. So that's an aspect of uh, entanglement that uh, is being utilized now. So, in other words, entanglement started out as, one could say, an embarrassment, especially for people like Einstein uh, in quantum mechanics, and and it's turned out to be a useful tool. So, in in the the kind of lingo of uh, of computer geeks, then that would be like saying it's not a it's not a glitch. It's a, it's a feature. Is what they is, is what they say. It's not a glitch. It's a feature. <laughs> I, I see. Well, this might be a good time to introduce uh, some of the ideas that were written about by David Kaiser in his book, which features you quite a bit. Uh, How the hippies save physics. Because well, you and I were back there in uh, Berkeley in the 1970s. We were roommates, and I remember how excited you were by uh, the fact that John Clauser was doing an experiment to actually test Bell's theorem. Yes, well, we were roommates or housemates back in 1973 when we were at the Institute for the Study of Consciousness, um, which is the institute that was founded by um, Arthur, Arthur Young. Um, anyway, uh, yes, uh, I, I had learned about... Um, Clauser, um, Clauser's work from Elizabeth Rauscher, who was a graduate student at Berkeley at the time, and uh, about the time that uh, that we met, um, that that I met um, Clauser, Elizabeth introduced me to him. Um, Elizabeth. Uh, Basically, engineered the uh, the idea of having of having Clauser involved in um, in a discussion seminar that began in um, 
in the spring of 19, 1975 and ran for several years. And, and that, and we, we endlessly discussed the foundations of quantum mechanics and uh, the EPR thought experiment and Clauser's experiments. Clauser was in the group and very active in the group. Uh, and that's what the book, How the Hippies Save Physics, uh, is all about and the sense in which we say physics is that we 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 brought the idea of entanglement of front and center um, we thought about applying it to all kinds of other offbeat things like telepathy and uh, psychokinesis and and so on um, and all of these things are are mentioned in uh, David Klaus's very interesting book. Uh, uh, David he, Kaiser. David Kaiser's uh, very interesting book. Uh, he he spent quite a bit of time writing that book. Uh, in the process of writing that book, he interviewed um, all of the people involved, including me, and we sent him uh, material uh, to include in the book if he wanted to. Um, and so it's... it's uh, well worth reading, I'd say. Um, mm. It's a very detailed description of what it was like back then uh, to be working on something that was considered so offbeat that it that if, if you were a graduate student working on it, it was really um, considered hard for your career. That you probably wouldn't get a a good position in a in a university uh, somewhere. And in fact, Clauser himself who was a very good experimentalist that did the first uh, Bell Theorem experiment, he, he was a postdoc at Berkeley for seven years, which, in other words, he, he, he himself couldn't get a good position um, for, more than se for more than seven years, actually. He was mm -hmm. actually a postdoc for seven years. Now, usually a post postdoctoral position is like a two-year appointment. Um, hardly any longer than that, mm -hmm. uh, and a postdoctoral position of seven years is uh, I probably probably a, a record, uh, and it's a record that proves the opposition at Berkeley to uh, um, to uh, people looking too carefully at the foundations of quantum mm -hmm. mechanics because. The idea was well, quantum mechanics is strange and crazy, but we but the math works perfectly, and we and and the predictions all work out perfectly. So rather than worrying about the foundations of quantum mechanics, you should just shut up and calculate, which is sort of the slogan that was thrown at people who wanted to look into the foundations of quantum mechanics. Now, people like Elizabeth Rauscher and and George Weissman, who were graduate students there, they they thought differently, and they they engineered the, the setting up of this um, seminar, which mm -hmm. went on, like I said, for several years, and they were very active people in that. Well, Clauser's experiments and, and the subsequent experiments have now shown over and over again that uh, if you take two particles uh, that's originate together and then travel far apart from each other, they still act as if they're in communication with each other and, and presumably instantaneously, meaning faster than the speed of light. Yes, yes, entanglement is an instantaneous connection. It's, yeah, it, it's, it, entanglement entails uh, in this instantaneous action at a distance that Einstein complained about in the spooky action at a distance. That's, you know, we, we don't use the word spooky, we just call it entanglement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, it, 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 but it is spooky in a way. And, and one of your concerns, and certainly amongst parapsychologists, we've wondered, could this be the mechanism behind extrasensory perception? Can you use entanglement, in effect, to send messages instantaneously across the universe? And I gather the answer is, at least the tentative answer, is not yet. Well, you see, one can generalize from particles... Uh, 
two you said two particles that have been you know together and move apart uh, no matter how far apart they're still in some sense in, con in contact with each other well in a sense the same goes for everything mm -hmm. At, anything that's been in contact will forever be entangled um once you shake hands with somebody, you're entangled, forever, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. Or even talk to somebody, presumably, you know. Well, this is what the mystics of every culture say. All is one. Everything is connected. Yeah, well, this would be, you know, a, a way of seeing this. But but if you're, if you're a physicist or a mathematician, you want to see the details of... of, mm -hmm. of and that's something that I've been concerned with. Um, that, that's why I've pursued the idea of of uh, hyperspace as as being um, the location of everything that's going on. And uh, and actually, uh, physics today is is very much uh, a hyperspace. Uh, physics. By when I say hyperspace, I mean that's a space-time of more than the usual four dimensions. Mm -hmm. And and uh, in string theory, uh, we have very specific ideas about uh, about the number of dimensions and how they function and so on. Uh, there there are two different versions of string theory. One, in a sense, one is uh, a ten-dimensional version, and the other is a twenty-six-dimensional version. And then there are versions of string theory that put the two together. That's called heterotic string theory. And there are actually five different string theories. Um, two of them being heterotic string theories. But uh, in nineteen ninety-five, um, Edward Witten unified. All five uh, string theories uh, as sub theories of an overarching theory he calls M theory, and that's an 11 dimensional theory um, in which the fundamental entities in M theory aren't, aren't even strings. They're, they're two dimensional objects, uh, ordinarily called membranes, uh, and five dimensional objects. There's the fundamental uh, aspects of uh, M theory. Mm hmm. Uh, so, and I've written in great detail about this in, in my book, uh, ADEX Theory, which was published in uh, 2016. Um, and uh, ADEX Theory has to do with the ADE Coxeter graphs, and, and the book shows how, how the, the ADE Coxeter graphs classify many different well, 20 some so far, different uh, mathematical entities, uh, and and they all are important in string theory. So I think of um, these Coxeter graphs as being the the basis for string theory. It's it's the matrix that string theory exists in. It's, now, it's, now we're talking matrix. about group theory in algebra, are we not? Group theory, yes. Uh, al groups in algebras. Well, f first of all, finite reflection groups are the are the, the, the basis for the uh, Coxeter. They're called Coxeter groups too, mm -hmm. um, and and that's the beginning of the of it. And of course, that was in nineteen and back way back in nineteen thirty five. There's that famous date again, mm -hmm. <laughs> nineteen thirty five, but yeah, various algebras um, and all kinds of other all kinds of other mathematical uh, s things like uh, catastrophes um, are classified by these things. And uh, really interesting is that uh, Heisenberg algebras are classified by the ADEs. I have mm -hmm. a whole chapter on that in my book, Heisenberg mm -hmm. algebras, and Heisenberg algebras exist in many different dimensions. Uh, the, the ordinary Heisenberg algebra is a seven-dimensional algebra, but but they you can have much bigger Heisenberg algebras than that. But they they all are classified. Every single Heisenberg algebra has to correspond to one of these ADE Coxeter graphs. Well, before That's we get interesting, before you know, we but, get too so far, 
fitting together. It's all, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm concerned that we're moving so fast we may lose some viewers. And so I'd yeah. like to step back for a moment and talk about uh, Platonism in mathematics and why uh, these mathematical relationships are so important. Yeah, well, one of the, one of the uh, things that, that the classification of, of uh, mathematical structures by, by means of these very, very simple Coxeter graphs itself suggests uh, a kind of platonic view of, of mathematics. In, fa in fact, I, I suggest in my book that the uh, ADE Coxeter graphs are uh, platonic uh, archetypes mm -hmm. for mathematics. Um, but meaning, simply, meaning that they are ontologically real, that they actually exist, not in physical space, but they do exist. Yeah, and they exist independently of us. Uh, that's that's a platonic idea. Um, and in mathematics itself, over the years, there there of course have been has been a lot of very interesting work on what's called the foundations of quantum mechanics. In other words, what I'm not quantum mechanics. Yeah, foundations of quantum mechanics is something that has to do with uh, the Einstein and Rosen Podolsky stuff. Um, but in mathematics itself. Uh, the foundations of mathematics was uh, very much up for grabs throughout the 20th century, throughout much of the 20th century. Uh, in other words, what's the basis for mathematics? Is it something that we just make up um, as a kind of a game? Well, that, that was one of the ideas, and it was proposed by a very famous, very important mathematician named Hilbert. And... Uh, that's called the formalist uh, foundations of quantum mechanics, um, of, not quantum mechanics, mathematics. Uh, mathematics. Uh, and then there's a logistic school of, of Russell and Whitehead, and they their idea was to was to derive all of mathematics from from the axioms of logic, mm -hmm. um, and they attempted they they. They spent some time in the early 20th century putting together three huge tomes um, of trying to show that some, at least some aspects of, of mathematics could be derived logically. And it, after the end of the, the first volume, they, they were able to prove that one plus one equals two. Uh, you know, it took mm -hmm. that. And anyway... Something very important happened in 1931. That's when Kurt Gödel proved that both the the logistic school and the formalist school were uh, were invalid beca because of of a famous theorem called called um, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what is left standing basically is the idea that that mathematics is platonic in the sense that what mathematicians are doing are not they're not making up mathematics they're discovering mathematics that already exists um, they're sort of like uh, explorers exploring a mathematical Magellanic um, Magellan type realm and one, one interesting implication of this of course is if there are mathematicians on other planets okay uh, then they would have discovered a lot of the same mathematics that we did there mm -hmm. would be an overlap and and presumably there would be things that we discovered that they didn't and vice versa and that would be interesting to mm -hmm. find out mm -hmm. uh, uh, that that would be an implication of the a platonic view of mathematics uh, that no matter no matter where uh, mathematics is being developed, uh, ultimately one one will find the same the same structures. Um, and uh, 
Gödel himself was a very strong Platonist, and by and large, mathematicians today uh, have a Platonic view of mathematics uh, because of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, 1931. Now, the the other remarkable thing about mathematics uh, is that it seems to fit so well the uh, empirical observations of physics. Yes, I and. Um, Wigner wrote a very famous uh, article, the paper on that, called the the uh, unexpected. Um, anyway, he's comparing mathematics and physics, and he's 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 finding it strange that that mathematics fits uh, physics so well. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, my book, Addict Theory, is is uh, the ultimate answer to uh, his 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 question about, about why. To, in fact, the subtitle of my book is "How the ADE Coxeter Graphs Unify Mathematics and Physics." Mm -hmm. So that's my answer to Wigner, um, and uh, who was, by the way, a very great physicist uh, who knew quite a bit of mathematics. He was uh, for years at, uh, a professor at Princeton. And we referred to Wigner earlier in relationship to von Neumann's idea about consciousness uh, collapsing the wave function. Yes, yes, and referred to Wigner's famous paper, the Notes on the Mind-Body Problem, mm -hmm. uh, where he where he employs uh, von Neumann's idea and pushes very, very strongly for the idea that consciousness is basic to to uh, quantum mechanics and therefore to reality. And, but not just Wigner and von Neumann and Schrodinger, virtually all the founders of quantum physics held this view, did they not? It was considered the standard view <clears throat> uh, and still is actually. It's mm -hmm. still considered the standard standard view and, and the majority of physicists probably, uh, probably have that view. Although there's, you know, there's, more recently, there there are many different attempts to uh, to found uh, quantum mechanics in a different way to get around this uh, the strangeness. Like there's the multiple worlds uh, version um, that everything everything that can happen does happen, but in different universes mm -hmm. that somehow attach to each other. But one problem with that is that is that nobody has figured out a way of of uh, using using that point of view to derive the uh, probabilities that quantum mechanics um, finds uh, necessary, and it, that's called the the Born um, probability uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, um, and um, you know, so if you if you can't use Born's theory, if you, um, then if you can't derive it from from um, from that <clears throat> point of view, then you know I think it's a pro it's problematic. Although it's a very interesting idea, uh, and then there are others like David Baum's idea. They had of uh, he very strongly uh, wanted to push Einstein's idea of the hidden variables. But uh, I would say that that Bell's theorem and in fact Bell's theorem is is partly based on um, on Bohm's ideas uh, and Bell was very uh, fond of Bohm's ideas and Bell himself wanted wanted there to be a hidden variable level of quantum mm -hmm. mechanics um, and but the experiments show that um, that if, if that you know, it's not really, it's not really, that hidden variable theory is not really viable. Well, let's, um, let's focus for a moment now on a paper you wrote. In fact, it was published by me as an appendix to the 1993 edition of my book, The Roots of Consciousness. And you, we published your paper called Consciousness, a Hyperspace View. Where, where you attempted to use the mathematics of hyperspace, and we're talking about group theory and the uh, Coxeter diagrams and, and so on, to uh, provide a mathematical basis for consciousness itself. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is very, this 
uh, I wrote this in 1988, and Jeffrey published it in uh, 1993 in the second edition of his book, um, The Roots of Consciousness. And it's it's a long paper, about 40 pages, uh, and I went into great detail uh, in uh, applying the Coxeter graphs to hyperdimensional structures and what what I pointed out was that um, there's there's because because of the uh, the the relationship of these graphs to different mathematical structures that there there are certain overlaps between these structures uh, that strongly suggest um, a kind of universal consciousness um, that that underlies that 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 is in the overlap uh, area between between two different mathematical structures um, and it, in order to make that clear one would have to uh, you know, show a diagram or something. I, I have the diagram, the Venn diagram of these structures in the paper. Well, I, I'll, I'll project them. Yeah, project uh, in, in uh, the video. They'll be in the video. As yeah. as you describe them, I'll put them up. Yeah. Um, well, um, it, it it's actually I actually propose a very specific um, algebraic structure called E seven. And E7 refers to uh, a Coxeter graph uh, with seven nodes, uh, and it's it, it it's related to many many different uh, aspects. Um, it uh, fundamentally, of course, corresponds to um, to the E7 Lie algebra and Lie group. Um, and it's a 133 dimensional structure by the way all by itself but it has a seven dimensional substructure which is called the cartan subalgebra and that cartan subalgebra is basically the uh what i call the reflection space of that uh of that structure you see each each of the coxeter graph ade coxeter graphs corresponds to a reflection space because you have you have a set of mirrors in the space, mathematical mirrors that um, are, function very much like an ordinary kaleidoscope. Actually, in fact, mm -hmm. Coxeter calls them kaleidoscopes. Um, they're hyper kaleidoscopes, hyperspace kaleidoscopes. Because what and, what we're looking at here are symmetries. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, and the symmetries are generated by the reflections. These mm -hmm. are reflection symmetries. In fact, they're called reflection reflection groups. Mm -hmm. um, the Coxeter groups are reflection groups. Um, and say Coxeter wanted to, back in the 30s, wanted to, to deal with the problem of uh, the, the characterization of, uh, of crystallographic structures in spaces of any number of dimensions. If you're a physicist, you stop at dimension three generally, um, for crystallographic structures. But if you're a mathematician, you don't stop, you never stop at dimension three. You want to go all the way, you know, to uh, dimensions of any number of dimensions, if you can pull it off, that is. Yeah. That's that's the ideal. Uh, and he was able to do this, amazingly, in, in the 30s. Uh, and he, so he created a set of graphs that... that um, depict very, very precisely what uh, crystallographic structures um, are possible in spaces of any number of dimensions. And the most important and the most useful of these graphs are the A's, the D's, and the E's. Mm -hmm. There's an infinite number of A's, there's an infinite number of D's, but very interestingly, there's only three E's, and the three E's correspond to... Um, to uh, actually, in a certain way, uh, to platonic platonic solids. Mm. Um, the 
E6 corresponds to the tetrahedron, and E, E7 uh, corresponds to the cube and the octahedron that are dual to each other, therefore they have the same symmetry structure, and E8 cor corresponds to the icosahedron and the dodecahedron, which are dual to each other. Mm -hmm. So all five platonic, these are called the platonic solids, um, because Plato um, talks about them in um, in more than one of his his uh, dialogues, especially the Theaetetus, uh, and and actually uh, Euclid, writing years later, uh, ends ends his famous book uh, with a proof of the 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 five Platonic solids are are the only possible. Uh, symmetries of that type. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, so, uh, so these. So what I'm what I'm claiming is that the E seven reflection space is, in some sense, the the uh, the space for universal consciousness. Why? Because it's because it's the overlap between two two different. Um, algebraic and physical structures um, that strongly suggest that. And in other words, there's a kind of a universal body and there's a universal mind. Um, and and then there's an overlap region which, which uh, really uh, controls them both in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, and and in order to see why one one would have to go deeply into into quantum mechanics actually this, um, be, because quantum mechanics is very basic to uh, to this whole picture but it's it's hard to describe just in words when you know um, but one you know, of the points that you a that, long paper describing it <laughs> one of the points you make about uh, reflection space mathematically is that uh, it's analogous probably in a meaningful way to the idea of reflection in consciousness yes yes that's something i wrote about in that paper yeah and it's true uh, it's it, it it start, we might think of it as a metaphor, but it's, but it's a metaphor that, in a way, cuts both ways. That um, reflection, um, in fact, various philosophers have suggested over the years that 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 thought fundamentally is reflection, and I don't know how how seriously they took that metaphor, but um, some more seriously than others, probably. But here, I'm I'm. I'm making a very detailed mathematical physics argument for that idea, um, and yeah, well, well, you see, the reflections in the reflection space are really uh, the magical thing doing all the work, so to speak. The because um, as we, because the when we say we have we have fundamentally a reflection group. Well, that means that that you have these mirrors, really hyper mirrors, because in each space of of uh, of any n dimensional space, the mirrors have to be mirrors have to be spaces of one dimension less in order to in order to cut the space in half, which uh -huh. the mirror has to do. Because these mirrors, a reflection mirror has. This is a mathematical idea of reflection, by the way. This isn't the way ordinary reflections work. It, ordinary reflections work by, as you know, bouncing light off of the mirror. Right. But if you're, if if you're Lewis Carroll, you you want you, you know, and you write about Alice through the Looking Glass. Uh, Alice, you know, went through the Looking Glass to. Um, to see the world on the other side of the looking glass, um, and um, so a, math a mathematical reflection is exactly like Alice's magic uh, looking glass. Uh, in other words, what what mathematical reflection does is it flips everything from one side of the mirror to the other side, and vice versa. That's what a mathematical reflection is, and 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 of course. If you have a set of 
basic mirrors in a space. If you have a seven-dimensional space, then you have seven basic mirrors, but they create a bunch, through reflection, create virtual mirrors, and all the reflections go through all, all the mirrors, um, but they're fundamentally created by the by the seven, in this case, the seven um, basic mirrors. And the thing is that the that uh, the that the that these uh, ref re these reflection points are very related to quantum mechanics in the sense that they that they are actually what we in in quantum mechanics we call the eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. um, see, in quantum mechanics. Uh, one very basic idea mm -hmm. is that is that when you when you make a measurement, um, you find you 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 find a specific state, call it uh, a state vector. Uh, the state vector is the mathematical representation of it. But what you really uh, what, you don't really see the state. What you see are what were called the eigenvalues. That correspond to that state. It's an eigenvalue, like, for instance, electric charge is an eigenvalue. Okay, it's something it's, that is actually observed, is it not? Is an eigenvalue, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the interesting thing is that is that the the points in the reflection space uh, are eigenvalues. Are mm -hmm. eigenvalues of and 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 uh, the states are are actually the um, the basis vectors of the algebra involved. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, so the, it sounds vector, okay, but it's hard for me to understand a, a term like basis states. Well, a base. Okay. Well, well. Okay. In, in three dimensional space, we talk about uh, x, y, z coordinates, right? Right. So to set up x, y, z coordinates, we we have three three vectors. Call them x vector, y vector, z vector. Yeah. Uh, those are those are the basis what we call basis states of a three dimensional space. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like in space time, you have an extra one called time. Okay. Uh, actually, we multiply the time by the speed of light in order so that they'll all be. Uh, in agreement that they're all describing distance. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, and so, so that's those are the ordinary, simple mm -hmm. examples of basis states. But mm -hmm. uh, any any vector space of any number of dimensions that has, if an n-dimensional vector space would have to have to have uh, n basis states or basis vectors mm -hmm. um, which uh, generate the entire the entire vector space in other words every point in the space um, is described in terms of the basis vectors uh, every, every, and and any point in the space is also uh, corresponds to a vector in the sense that you take that point and you draw a line back to the origin yeah. The origin is where all the where all the basis vectors cross. By the way, where but, they originate. Well, here's my question: If we're talking about hyperspace, uh, and we're talking about eigenvalues, an eigenvalue, if it's actually observed, how do we observe an actual value if it's not in three d dimensional uh, space or, f or four dimensional space time? How can we make an observation in a higher dimension of space? Well, the higher okay, the higher dimensional structures are projected down to lower dimensional structures, um, and this is implicit uh, actually in the uh, in these Coxeter graph diagrams because the the, the higher dimensional structures, uh, and this is true for crystallography, um, the higher dimensional crystallography, the the higher dimensional crystals project down to lower dimensional crystals and the same goes for eigenvalues um, and eigenvectors um, they so in other words what we see in three-dimensional space 
always from this point of view is 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 really a projection from a higher dimensional space now actually this idea of of reality being a higher dimensional structure that projects down to a lower dimensional structure is implicit in Plato and Plato's famous cave analogy or mm -hmm. cave um, story about um, people that are chained uh, in, in a cave in such a way that and there's a there's a uh, light behind them some torches or something and they see their shadows on the cave wall and they identify themselves with their shadows because they're chained in such a way that they can't even move their head it's this is just a thought experiment of plato's yeah. uh and it seems to me that that uh that's my phone ringing um uh, it seems to me that plato plato is suggesting that we three-dimensional creatures we identify uh, ourselves with our three-dimensional bodies, but that we're actually higher-dimensional entities, um, you know, uh, living in some higher-dimensional, what we could call platonic realm, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, many people have, have suggested this uh, way of interpreting uh, Plato's famous cave story and uh, in the Republic, Book Seven of the Republic, um, and um, every every uh, college student probably is required to read the Republic at some point, you know, since it's considered basic in some sense to uh, Western civilization. But in effect, you're suggesting that human consciousness could be like this. That uh, it, it, let's say at the death of our three-dimensional body, a, a higher, a hyperspace consciousness will continue. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and and of course, Plato, Plato very much believed uh, believed in this kind of immortality of of the soul. He might call it suki. Suki is the Greek word uh, that he would use. Um, Psychology is based on that word, by the mm -hmm. way, Suki. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, apparently uh, he he'd gone through uh, through exercises, uh, uh, you know, mystical exercises, which convinced him. Mm -hmm. uh, that that the soul lived on after after death the so-called Eleusinian mysteries mm -hmm. uh, uh, outside uh, um, Athens which were there were many mystery schools but that was the one that had very high prestige in Plato's time uh, and he went through it and maybe Socrates went through it I'm not sure but certainly Plato did and many other uh, important people in Greek times uh, yeah, so um, pretty much uh, to my knowledge, uh, all of the leading citizens of Athens went through the Eleusinian mysteries, and we know very little about the details of what happened because they were sworn to secrecy. But my understanding is they all came back convinced of the immortality of the soul. Yes, that's correct. That's what the historians of that period tell us and 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 of course they wrote about it they mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't reveal any secrets they just said well i'm convinced of this that and the other you know mm -hmm. and they didn't say why yeah um, but now you're basically arriving at uh, a similar conclusion based on uh, the your interpretation of contemporary physics and mathematics that's correct yeah that's correct uh and and I push that very strongly uh, in in the paper that that is in in your book, the in, appendix paper. In fact, I'm linking to it right now. So if uh, viewers want to read that paper, if you click on the upper right hand of your screen where it says "click here now," uh, it will take you to uh, a PDF version of uh, Saul Paul's appendix. Well, well, Saul Paul, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Here, uh, we're off to a really good start. I know we have a, a, a lot of other topics we can cover, uh, but, uh, but I'm very happy that we uh, did this, and, and I look forward to having many more conversations with you.
Yes, it was fun, Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you for being with me. And uh, I want to thank our audience as well for being with us. Thank you.